we're going to be learning about Millikan's experiment that they used to actually find uh, the elementary charge. I like this name. <laughs> I mean, it can't even. That's because this is his experiment that he did. So I'm giving you a very uh, simplified version of what they did. So Millikan and Fletcher, this is in 1909. They're trying to look at what would happen to uh, in charged particles in an electric field. And they used oil drops because uh, they didn't want to use water, for example, because water could evaporate and then the mass isn't constant. But at least, uh, and they were charging these oil drops. So for example, let's say you charge them positively. So then these are positively charged oil drops. Well then, if you shove them between, uh, for example, uh, two parallel plates, where let's say the bottom is positively charged, the top maybe is negatively charged, remember what happens with electric fields. Electric field is always the direction that a positive test charge would go. So if I want to find out the direction of the uh, electric field, it turns out it's going to be up. That's going to be the electric field direction. Okay, so up and up and up and up. I mean, this will be the direction of the electric field. Okay, so if I have that, let's just say, um, well then what does that mean? Well, we can look at what the oil drops will actually feel. Now because they're positively charged, they're going to go in the same direction as the electric field. And so what can we say about that? Well, we can say a couple things, right? We can feel, uh, say that, for example, they will feel um, a gravitational force, which will be down. Right? Um, and what will that be? That will be equal to, uh, let's see, it'll be just m times g. So there'll be that force acting on them. So that'll be acting downwards on these ones. But they're also going to feel an electric force. And that's going to be an upwards force. Now why is that? Well, because we have Fe equals Eq. Now where did that come from? Well, we have our equation from our formula, or, or sorry, data booklet, that goes E equals F over Q. E equals F over Q. So because of that, you can solve for F, and there we go. So now we have these two forces. We have a downwards mg, so a gravitational force, and an upwards electric force, so E times Q. All right, what does this mean for us? Well, that means that what they would do is they would, because uh, keep in mind, this might make them accelerate, they might go up, they might go down. It all depends on the strength of the electric field. So as they as they play around with the potential difference across these, obviously a bigger potential difference makes a bigger electric field. So if they make it really, really high, they can make them go up. If they make them really, really small or turn it off, then the drops will go down because of gravity. And they can do something special where, because uh, sometimes they might be accelerating, but if you can get it just right where they don't accelerate, now it uh, they don't accelerate. It doesn't mean they stay still necessarily. They could just be at a constant speed. That's fine. But if there's no net force, what does that mean? Well, that means that the upwards electric force, whoops, I'm just bad at drawing straight arrows here. So, so, so the upwards electric force, at that point then it must be exactly equal to the downwards Gravitational force. So I'll try to make this near the same length. Hope it worked. There we go. Yeah, it seems about right. So if they have uh, no electric force, well then we can say then the you know Fe equals Fg. Well, if that's the case, then I can put them together, can't I? Remember Fe. Let's see. What was Fe? Oh yeah, it was Eq. So that means then I can say then that Eq must equal m g. From that then they can conclude, hey, uh, hold on, let's get Q by itself. So if we're going to get Q by itself, we get mg over E. Can you see that we get m times g over the electric field strength. And this was basically one of the important equations that they could use. So they could say, hey, the charge is going to be m times g divided by the electric field strength. But don't forget, we also have another equation. But we have the electric field across two parallel plates is actually just equal to V over D. If that's the case, then what can I do? Well, that means that I'm going to say, well, Q equals, let's see, it's going to be MG over V over D. And remember what happens if you divide by a fraction and multiply by the reciprocal. So I could say then that Q equals, let's see, it's going to be MG and this D flips, it comes up. So it's MGD over v, where v is not the velocity, v is the uh, potential difference. So this here is the potential difference across those plates. So this one right here then is really important. Because what they could do then is if they know the distance, which they do, um, if they know the potential difference that they did across it, and they know the mass of these particles, then they could actually find out what is the actual charge. And it turns out when they found the charge of these particles, and you can do this for other particles as well, 
charge is always seeming to be some multiple of a number. So it's always maybe 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, or it's maybe 3 times or 4 times or whatever. So it turns out they're like, hey, this seems to come in quantized amounts, specific amounts. So anytime we say that something is quantized, it just means it comes in specific countable amounts, like 1 times this number, or 2 times this number, or 3 times this number. And they're always being some multiple of this right here, this um, what's well, called the elementary charge. So an electron, for example, we say has a you know charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. But other particles might have you know two times this charge, for example, or whatever. So that's why this is really important because this experiment was evidence for the quantization of charge. So let's look at what this might do for your exams. So on the exams, you might have them include other things as well, because maybe this is going through a fluid of some kind. So I could anticipate, for example, I bet they're gonna, you know, you're gonna be asked sometimes about a buoyancy force or maybe a viscous drag force as well. So you have to remember what happens with these forces as well. So let, let's just say we have a situation where the whole thing is actually, let's say it's moving upwards. Okay, so let's just pretend this is actually, you're told, you know what, this thing is moving upwards. Let's look at the different forces on this thing, okay? So first of all, what's going to be acting on it? Well, there's going to be a downwards um, downwards gravitational force. What's going to be upwards? Well, keep in mind, if it's moving upwards, there must be um, a buoyancy force. That'll be upwards. That's true. There must be that electric force. So that's going to be Fe. And there's also going to be a downwards drag force. In this case, only because the drag force always acts opposite to its motion. So if it was moving down, for example, then the drag force would be up. And you might be told some things about this, but what really matters then is that, hey, if you're told it's got constant speed, remember what that means? That means F net equals zero. That means all the upwards forces are equaling and canceling out the downwards forces. So in this case, then let's just say, um, let's say, so let's say the upwards force. So let's say which ones are up. That would be Fe plus Fb, and that will equal, uh, well, Fd plus Fg. And those would be the downwards force. Right, because when the net force is zero, you have that the upwards force is a downwards force. So that's the what I want to say here. So said so F up equals F down. At least that's in case they tell you this. Okay, so that's an important sort of pro tip here. And what can we do with this right here? Like maybe you're wondering, like what what would you actually do for these equations? Let's just be reminded of what you could actually put in for each of these. So this one right here, for example, for Fe, remember what that one was? We had a few different versions of it, but we could say it's um, wait, where is it? Here it is. So we could say it's eq, for example. So we'll go back over here and say, okay, that's great. That's eq. Now what's the buoyancy force? Well, that from your uh, data book, it's rho times v times g. And that's going to equal, for example, so just to show you here what you can do, that's going to equal the drag force. You can look that one up as well. So that's going to be, hold on a second, this, yeah. So it's 6 times pi times the viscosity, uh, you know, times the radius of the sphere, for example, times the speed. And all that, of course, is going to be plus the downwards mg. So for example, you could do some kind of setup like this. Obviously, if it's uh, down, maybe something's different. It all depends on what's going on, okay? But just remember that in general, though, um, all the upwards forces will equal and cancel out all the downwards forces. You just got to think about which way does it go. So again, buoyancy force will always be up. Gravitational force will always be down. And the electric field uh, force, it depends. It depends which way they've uh, oriented those plates. And the drag force will always be opposite to the motion. So if it's moving up, the drag force will be down. If it's moving down, the drag force is up. So you basically use your brain, figure out which ones go where, and then just do this sort of summation here that all the ups have to equal all the down, like the totals. And there you go. So that's how we can deal with Millikan's experiment on exams. But it's pretty cool because they actually found out that, yeah, charge is actually quantized.